If you would ask me, I'd say I am definitively South. I was born with one blue eye and one black eye in a beautiful island in the center of the Mediterranean Sea, Sicily. An island of striking contrasts and extreme feelings, breathtaking beauty, all shades of red between the sea and the sky, but also forgotten ruins, earthquakes and ghost cities, fire, abandoned dreams, death, passion, six million loud inhabitants, <laughs> stolen hopes, and super delicious food. <laughs> When I was 14, with my friends, we had absolutely no idea where Helsinki was. At that time, at school, maps of Europe looked like this. <laughs> Nowadays, luckily, the situation has changed, and this is the way in which Italians see Europe and Finland. But back then, I would not conceive the possibility of staying in a small room at 80 degrees, surrounded by naked people, possible, really, or let alone fun. <laughs> and I thought that I would never ever in my life, for any possible reason, leave my beautiful island. So, how come this? <laughs> At the age of 40, I find myself married to a Finnish man, working in a Finnish university, a great enthusiast of smoke sauna, secretly hoping for Yolupukki to arrive in the snow, and enjoying eating risi puro with cinnamon with frozen fingers at the Christmas market. So what happened in between? Well, I became a physicist, and I started to travel up and down the globe for work. Every year or two, I would pack everything I had in a 20 kilogram suitcase, and off I went to follow my dream to be a quantum physicist. After my PhD in Palermo, I went to Sofia, Bulgaria, then for a quick pit stop in Palermo, before heading south all the way to Durban, South Africa then up again to Sofia, Bulgaria, up north, first time in Finland, Turku, then a little bit down and left to Edinburgh, and then finally I'm back to Turku. So I think I know what I mean when I say living in north or in south. And by the way, this is the way in which Bulgarians see Europe and Finland. You see, not a huge difference in the way in which Italians and Bulgarians see Finland, but Sweden, on the other hand, goes from Nobel Prize to ABBA. <laughs> I don't think I exaggerate when I say that moving north has been the key event of my life in all senses. And nowadays, there are so many typically Nordic things that are part of my life, and I couldn't imagine living without them. I love the way in which life changes with seasons, or this. Or perhaps the most important thing for me, the mummy kiss. <laughs> but virtually everyone who knows I'm from Sicily asks me, isn't it difficult for someone from the south to live so far north? This, I think, is one of the most common questions I'm asked these days. But what do we mean with north? What do we think when we think north? How do we picture north as opposed to south? These questions touch me at a very personal level, because from a geographical point of view, I was born and lived 30 years of my life in the south, and now I live in the north. But most importantly, these external facts somehow deeply reflect very opposite traits of my character that in some way coexist. The southern me, is self-centered, loud, very talkative, social, communicative, interested and attentive in other people, prone to gossip. 
very passionate about things. The northern me has a strong need for solitude and isolation, likes nature and silence, enjoys places that are not too loud, and also is perfectionist and likes to have everything in order. So the main question for me tonight is, does it really make sense to talk about North and South at a very fundamental level? Or are these concepts somehow emerging in our minds, culture, society, to help us navigate and orient ourselves in Middle Earth? I don't have a final definitive answer about this question, but I know for sure that if we zoom in and look at the level of microscopic particles, the quantum world, then North and South do not exist as independent opposite concepts. Why is it so? And what can quantum physics tell us about it? Quantum mechanics is very much more than just a theory. It's a completely new way of looking at the world involving a change in paradigm perhaps more radical than any other in the history of human thought. A change in paradigm more radical than any other. I truly believe this. Quantum mechanics has now become an indispensable tool in almost each sub-branch of physics, from the cosmology of the early universe to the physics of human vision, from the structure of the nucleon to the behavior of superconductors. It is undoubtedly the most fundamental physical theory of the universe. But the behavior of microscopic particles is strikingly counterintuitive when we compare it with our experience of the world. Quantum particles can pass through solid walls. They can be in two different positions at the same time. What does it mean? It is not easy to talk about quantum physics to people. And it's not because normal people don't quite care about quantum physics or have better things to talk about. I think, on the contrary, that a lot of people are eager to hear quantum stories. But the problem is the language. Because the only way I can tell you of the mysterious and bizarre quantum wonderland, the only truly correct way I can say what a quantum superposition of here and there really is, is by using a very, very difficult and not so common language. And it's not Finnish language, <laughs> it's mathematics. The need to use mathematics to describe the world reaches its peak when we attempt to describe the microscopic world of electrons, atoms, even molecules that are the building blocks of everything around us. The reason of this is that while we have a very powerful description of these objects in mathematical terms, this is the formalism of quantum theory, we lack any sort of intuition about their physical reality, till the point that we are pushed to question whether they have an independent reality at all. Physicist Richard Feynman clearly illustrated our difficulty with the problem of the description of the atom, saying that it's like having a car for which we can make accurate predictions, because we have the math right. Say, we can predict the car's speed, but we cannot picture the car. Similarly, I know how to describe a quantum superposition of north and south. I have the math right. But for you, these are just symbols written on the blackboard. What does it actually mean to be north and south at the same time? And how can we even try to have an intuition of something that we have never experienced in our life, and perhaps never will? And if an atom can be here and there at the same time, why I cannot? I'm made of atoms, after all. Even objects visible to the eye have been prepared in a state in which, at the same time, they vibrate and are at rest. 
then is it really true that I cannot be here and there at the same time? Or is it just too difficult to put me in this state? Is there any physical law preventing me to be here and there at the same time? Because if not, I really would like to try it. How would that feel like? How would my mind and consciousness experience that? Weird, it would be weird for sure, but I could be at the same time eating an ice cream in Sicily and in Savu Sauna in Finland. How cool would that be? Well, it's not so simple to create superpositions in the lab. It has taken several decades before the famous Schrödinger cat Gedanken experiment of a cat in a box in a superposition of dead and alive has been created. And actually not with a real cat. And the reason of this difficulty is that quantum superpositions are very quickly destroyed by what we call their external environment. What happened is, if a particle is in a superposition of north and south, then because of the interconnection with everything around her, the superposition is washed out and at the same time, the particle acquires the well-defined property of position, being either north or south. But bear in mind, this is rather curious. Another way of saying this is that if a particle were completely isolated and nobody ever tried to watch her, then she may well not possess a well-defined position. She would only acquire this property after we observe her. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean that there should really be someone looking at the particle. What happens is that everything around her, her environment, behaves as something that continuously observes the particle and in this way makes her real. This is truly mind-blowing. It is the interconnection between all objects in nature that eventually defines them as having an objective reality. It is the interconnection between everything that exists that makes things real. But if we zoom in and look at the level of the very fundamental particles, the constituents of the universe, if we look at the behavior of the most fundamental theory, then north and south do not exist as independent opposite concepts. And in the same way, it is this interconnection between all things that creates the dichotomy of north and south in Middle Earth. But now, let's zoom out and look at north and the Earth from farther and farther and farther away. This is a photograph of planet Earth, taken in 1990 by Voyager 1 space probe. From a record distance of six billion kilometers from Earth. And these are the words of Carl Sagan describing this picture. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, 
every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. A moth of dust suspended in a sunbeam. North and South do not exist in the microscopic world of quantum particles forming the universe around us. North and South collapse into a pale blue dot when we look from far away. Of course, we are not atoms or electrons, even if we are made of them, and our life is made of the burnt toast, the broken boiler in the kitchen, the noisy neighbor. After all, we do live in Middle Earth. But when we think of North and South as opposites, when it is us or them, when North is better than South or North is worse than South, when it is North against South or South against North, then we should remember how it is when we look from close zooming in and when we zoom out. And we should wait for a moment and think again. Thank you.